Guys, can you hear me now? I can hear you now. Nothing. Oh, you can hear me now. Okay. Well, I, I don't. Uh, I apologize uh, to everyone for the technical difficulties. Uh, it's not clear if everyone on the on the broadcast can hear me or not. But uh, it's definitely important that the presenters today can hear me, so that we can communicate. Um, so let's let's start over and and hope that uh, everyone is hearing me now. Um, welcome to the Estate Planning in Uncertain Times, hosted by Kennedy & Co. I am publisher of the Northern Colorado Business Report, Jeff Nuttall, and I will be your moderator today. First, I want to give you all some background on Kennedy & Co., which is an 80-year-old accounting and consulting firm based in Salina, Kansas. Through their eight offices in Kansas and Colorado, including their office in Loveland, Kennedy & Co. serves clients from coast to coast with an emphasis on agriculture, manufacturing, banking, real estate, and high net worth individuals. In addition to traditional tax and auditing services, the team at Kennedy & Co. provides strategies for estate planning, wealth management, finance, human resources, and mergers and acquisitions. For further information, please contact Kennedy & Co. at their website or phone numbers that will be provided at the end of the presentation. Um, before we get started with presentations, I want to remind you all how you can participate in today's webinar. Attendees will be in listen-only mode on your phones and speakers, but we do encourage you to ask questions through the control panel on the right of your screen. We will hold these questions until the last 10 to 15 minutes of today's webinar and answer them during the Q&A portion. However, I do encourage you to go ahead and type your questions when you think of them, and then we'll have them loaded in the queue for when we get to that point. Right now, you should be seeing today's agenda on your screen. We will be asking for poll questions today that are going to be interspersed throughout the presentation. And now let's meet today's presenters. Blake Allen is a certified financial planner with Kennedy & Co. He joined the firm in 2002 as a consultant and financial advisor based out of the Wichita, Kansas office. Blake provides a broad range of services including income and estate taxation, financial planning for high net worth individuals, and business transition planning in addition to providing asset management and insurance solutions. Blake is a graduate of Fort Hayes State University with a Bachelor of Business Administration in Finance and a Bachelor of Business Administration in Accounting with an emphasis on personal financial planning. Blake holds the FINRA Series 7 and 63 licenses and is a licensed life insurance agent and maintains the certified financial planner trademark professional designation, which he earned in 2005. He is a member of the Financial Planning Association, the Young Professionals of Wichita, and has served on the Financial Planning Advisory Committee for Fort Hayes State University. Joining Blake today is Jim Rhine. Jim is a CPA with Kennedy & Co. based in the Loveland office. Jim, who is a 1994 graduate from the University of Nebraska and Lincoln, where he earned his bachelor's degree in business administration, joined Kennedy & Co. in January 1996. Jim currently is a manager in the Wealth Creation Group. Jim's professional experience has mainly involved tax planning and compliance for partnerships, LLCs, S corporations, C corporations, individuals, and fiduciaries, along with estate planning and general business consulting for a variety of the firm's clients. Jim is a member of the American Institute of CPAs and the Colorado Society of CPAs. He currently holds a CPA certificate in both Colorado and Nebraska. He taught accounting at Mesa State College and is a former board member for a University of Nebraska alumni chapter and is also a former board member for the Weld County chapter of Ducks Unlimited. Now, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Blake and Jim. Thank you for that introduction. Uh, my name is Blake Allen. Um, as Jeff said, I'm located in our Wichita, Kansas office, and uh, Jim is joining us from uh, Loveland, Colorado. Uh, we appreciate you guys taking time out over your lunch break to uh, listen to what we have to talk about today. Uh, our topic of conversation will be estate planning in uncertain times. And although we, 
we hope we have some guidance from some legislation proposed earlier this week. Uh, as we know with, uh, with Congress right now, nothing is set in stone until, until that legislation is passed. So uh, in today's topics, we're going to address estate planning, give a history of where we've come from and where we think we're going, also give a background on some of the basic tools and documents that are needed to facilitate the estate planning process. Uh, but please feel free, as Jeff said, to ask your questions. Uh, we really want this to be an interactive uh, presentation and, and hope to solicit information from you all as well. So the first question that we, we have is, you know, what is estate planning? And typically what clients think about of estate planning is it has to do with death. So it's not an easy topic for most individuals to want to address. It, it's just not fun talking about how you're, how you're going to pass your assets to your family or, or facilitate that wealth transfer upon your death. Um, but the flip side of that is, and I think this quote summarizes it best, is you know, everyone has to get organized at some point. You just may not be around for it. So when we're talking about estate planning, you know, the usual emphasis is on how do you pass assets onto that next generation or to a surviving spouse. And that is a huge part of estate planning. So determining where those assets go during life and death, you know, you want to provide for your family, which includes yourself, your spouse, your children. Uh, one item that's becoming more and more popular is trying to set aside assets for any family members that do have special needs and, and trying to provide for a lifetime of care for those individuals. Uh, and a lot of people have charitable intents with their estate plans. You know, they want to leave a legacy uh, beyond what their life expectancy is. Uh, also in estate planning, uh, a major goal in this process is to minimize the taxes as much as possible. You know, most people's intent is to not pay Uncle Sam any more than they absolutely have to. You know, we want those assets to pass on to the next generation. We want the continuity of our businesses to continue into those future generations. Uh, some other points of estate planning that don't get talked about often but are almost as important as minimizing taxes and, and passing those assets on include avoiding family disputes. You know, when, when a generation passes away and the next generation is trying to take over a business or is inheriting a substantial sum of assets, there always will be some tension inside of that transition. So by clearly defining your planning goals and explaining those goals to the, the interested parties, you know, we always strive to avoid those disputes whenever possible. Uh, another huge goal is to protect assets. Um, that's just where we are as a society today is that people like to sue one another, uh, right or wrong. And so protecting assets is becoming a huge piece of trying to protect yourself and your family. Um, you know, for those of you with minor children, you know, you have some responsibility if they were to do something wrong. And so, you know, if creditors were able to attach to your children's assets and therefore your assets, you know, we do try and find creative solutions that will try and, and shield those claims away from your assets. And then, uh, as I mentioned before, you know, transferring those business assets and management onto that next generation is, is vitally important because you know, one of the biggest drivers of, of our economy as a whole is small and family-owned businesses. You know, they're some of the largest employers that we have nationwide collectively. Uh, they provide a lot of the economic uh, stimulus. They provide a lot of the innovation that's out there that really keeps our economy going and competing with the rest of, of the world. So what it really comes down to, you know, uh, estate planning is not just about death, taxes, and probation. There, there's a lot of other avenues that we need to address when we're talking about estate planning. And even more so now when we don't have clear guidance on where the estate tax law is going in the future, uh, you know, we do, have to, we do have to take into account all these different factors. And Blake, I'd also add to what, and you had mentioned it earlier, this, this is Jim speaking, the, the concept of being able to provide your family a blueprint. And we touch on, on that in each of these bullet points, but a concern that, that we've ran into 
talking with folks is this desire to take care of this planning now and provide that planning to their family so that the family's not forced to have to do something later. So everyone knows what the plan is and their job is to execute that plan uh, once that generation may not be with us. So talking about how we execute that plan, we're going to shift gears a little bit and talk about some of the documents and ownership types that, that we typically see when we're dealing with estate planning. I believe we have a poll question that's going to come up on, on the participant screens here. All right. And the first poll question is, when is the last time you reviewed your estate plan and documents? If everyone would go ahead and answer this, please. All right, we've got about 90% participation. And here are the answers. In 2010, 38%. Over the last five years, 25%. Over the last 10 years, 13%. And 25% have not reviewed it. OK. And those results, you know, that they're not surprising at all because, again, we are in such uncertain times. You know, a lot of people are taking a wait-and-see approach. Some people are being proactive with trying to stay in touch with the estate planning law and making sure their documents are up to date. So we do want to describe some of those documents and types of ownership that, that are typically involved in a, the estate planning process. So the most basic document that a lot of individuals have or need to have is a will. And a will simply defines how your assets are to be distributed uh, upon your passing. They also establish guardianship for minors and the responsible party to execute the will and oversee the distribution of those assets. So the will really has a lot of power in how you want it to your estate directed upon your passing. Um, the next document on the screen is a power of attorney. And so the power of attorney is a document that simply empowers another person to act on your behalf. Uh, you can give that power at any time that you choose, but typically that, that springs to power upon incapacitation. So if, if you, for instance, would end up in the hospital and are unable to you know, manage some financial affairs, this power of attorney would spring to life and your, your, pow your attorney would in fact be able to conduct business on your behalf. However, we want to make clear that with the power of attorney, you know, you cannot give that person the power to revoke or execute a new will on your behalf. You know, they will have to follow the documents that you've laid out. And they don't have to have complete access and or don't have complete power. You know, you can be as general with that or as limited as you would like. But the point is, you know, if you're unable to make decisions you would, you would like somebody else to be able to make, help make those decisions for you. Uh, next document on the screen is a living will. And what that does is it simply defines your health care wishes should you become unable to communicate. And, and we usually see that in conjunction with a special power of attorney called a medical power of attorney or health care power of attorney. Uh, sometimes these are called health care directives. And that what those are is they appoint an agent, again, to make those health care decisions, but generally they're going to follow the instructions of your living will. So what these will do is, again, if you become incapacitated, they will give uh, your chosen attorney the power, in fact, to deal with the hospitals to, again, determine your standard of care. And the whole reason that we have a lot of these documents in place, again, is if this event happens and you do become incapacitated, you know, it's a very emotional and traumatic time for your family. So again, having that blueprint that we re referred to earlier of, of how you would like your affairs to proceed really takes a lot of stress out of the situation for your family members. So those are some of the basic estate planning documents uh, that we deal with. Uh, the next bullet point on there talks about ownership. Um, you know, we talked about the will directing ownership of property upon your passing. Uh, 
you can direct ownership simply by the title of your assets. So some of the examples that you see there, uh, the JTWROS simply stands for Joint with Rights of Survivorship. Uh, that means you would have joint ownership of a property with someone else and upon the death of one of the owners, the, po the property would simply pass to the surviving owner, regardless of what your will says. That is quite different from the next transfer ownership type on there, which is called joint tenants, tenancy in common. Uh, what this type of ownership does is it will transfer your interest without that right of survivorship, so it will pass by your will's direction. So those are ver two very different types of ownership, and you know these these ownership designations. You want to be sure, especially when you're dealing with real estate or or residences, that you have this these titled correctly, because it doesn't take very much for the county office or or you to simply make an error and have the wrong type of ownership listed. Uh, you can also pass assets using a transfer on death or a pay on death designation. Uh, the, you know, those simply name the beneficiary, again, regardless of the will, or then any other assets that you have, uh, including retirement accounts, uh, 401ks, IRAs, uh, life insurance, you know, those, are, those will all pass by contract. So making sure that those beneficiary designations and, and transfers match up with your intent and with the direction of your will, you know, that, that really is a process that, that does need to be reviewed. If you don't have any of these documents, you know, especially if you don't have a will, the state rules of where you live, you know, they're going to define how your property is distributed at your time of death. So whatever the state of Colorado decides, for the most part, that's how the assets would get split up if you didn't have a will. Typically what happens there is that they usually will split assets between any surviving children and a surviving spouse. And then if there, if none of those parties exist, they will usually push assets up to your parents' generation or, or out to any siblings that you would have. Another common document that we deal with a lot is trusts. And so the trust can either be a document established on its own or it can be established inside of a will. But the basic relationship of a trust is the same in all instances. So you have a trustee who has the legal ownership of assets of the trust but doesn't have the right to the assets because those assets are for the ultimate benefit of a named beneficiary. Now, with these trusts, one person can be all, all of these parties. So an individual can set up a trust for their own behalf. Therefore, they are the trustee and the beneficiary. When they pass away, though, they obviously are no longer the trustee or the beneficiary, so, the tr so this trust document will name who is to become that trustee and who will be the next beneficiary, the contingent beneficiary. So as long as you, as long as you are all these parties, you, know, you have a lot of rights to those assets because in essence they would be your own assets, but when something happens and this trust becomes irrevocable, that's when we have a lot of legal responsibility and fiduciary responsibility on behalf of the trustees to the beneficiary. The, the trust document where this has a lot of power is that you as the creator of the trust have the right to set the terms of the trust document. And these terms are very important because the laws give great latitude in determining how you want assets to be distributed or, or how you want decisions made. So for instance, if you have uh, let's say you have minor children and you decide that if something happens to you and your spouse, you can set terms in the trust you know, that you don't want your children to have access to the money until they hit a specific age or if a specific event happens, say college graduation, or you could split you know, them getting assets up based on you know, they get half at age 30, a third at age, or a fourth at age 35, and the remainder at age 40. So these terms of, of inheritance can be very, very general. They can also be as specific as you want. And these trusts can also be great vehicles for asset protection, which we are going to talk about again later. And when, when we use the term trust, um, lots of different 
visions come to mind. And the reason why is there's, because of that latitude that's allowed, every trust is different. There's certainly similar names to some of these different trusts that we won't get into to all the jargon of how these are called. But one point I, I'd like the participants to take away from today is that if your concerns are about asset protection for your family uh, when your assets pass to them, uh, certainly the estate tax uh, issues that, that may arise based upon on your estate, trusts are a great tool to use that provide the family the protection we've talked about, these items that we're, we're talking about today, but it also can provide quite a bit of flexibility for the family as well. Um, so this moniker that trusts are these steel boxes that hold assets that you just can't ever crack open for any purpose just isn't true. Um, there are certain cases of that that was probably the intent of someone when they created that trust at the time. <coughs> So just keep in mind that there's quite a bit of flexibility during during that planning phase if you are are considering a trust. So again, those, those are a lot of the the typical documents that you'll see in estate planning. So so next we're going to talk about you know gift taxes and estate taxes, how we got to this point. But first, I think we have another poll question. We do. And the next question is. It is better to give away highly appreciating assets to future generations. That's is it. True or false? Please answer now. And we have 100% of the votes in. And the trues are 71% and the false are 29. Okay, and the, and the real answer to that question is, is it depends. Are you trying to address that question from an income tax perspective or an estate tax perspective? So from an estate tax perspective, it, it is better to give away highly appreciating assets but that may not be the best answer from an income tax perspective. So that's why you need to look at all angles of your blueprint before making that decision. So when we talk about gifting, and again, this is where we talk a little bit about where we've come from and about where we're going. You know, each individual has, has a lifetime gifting exemption of, in the current year, it's $1 million, and annual exemptions of $13,000 per donee. That means if you have two children, you can give each one of them $13,000 every year uh, for the rest of your life and never use any of your lifetime exclusion. You can also give any amount of assets that you'd like to to a spouse or to charities. They are completely exempt from gift tax. So where the gift tax has come from is it's, it's been a, so on gifts over a million dollars, the gift tax has, has been taxed at a graduated rate between 35 and 55 percent depending on the year. So in our current year, 2010, that gift tax rate is 35 percent. But for example, say, uh, you know, we say an individual makes a taxable gift of two and a half million dollars and then assume that the tax rate of 50 percent. So how we come up with the gift tax amount is, you know, we simply take the two and a half million dollars subtract away the lifetime exemption of $1 million, multiply that times our tax rate of 50%, and we come up with a $750,000 gift tax. You know, if you would, th there are ways to reduce that amount. Uh, one of those ways is to, if you elect to split gifts with a spouse, you know, you assume the same facts from the prior example. So instead of using only $1 million of lifetime exclusion, you're able to use $2 million. That leaves you know, the gift tax at $250,000 as opposed to the seven fifty. So that is one way that you're able to maneuver in this gift tax world. There are other ways such as using uh, discounts or entities to try and get more assets and more appreciation out of your estate. Uh, th those get more complex, but they have a lot of value, especially today with, with how the 
overall economy has has depressed property prices, you know, values of companies, values of real estate, you know, those values are coming back up. The economy is starting to recover, but being able to take advantage of those suppressed values is a great opportunity. Uh, in all cases, though, gifted property will retain a carryover basis. So again, you know, coming back to that poll question, you know, which asset is the right asset to give away? Well, you know, Ideally, we'd like to give away highly appreciating assets, but how much basis do you have in that asset? It, it, it may not be the right answer every time. Okay, and I think we have a, another poll question. Or, I'm sorry, Jim, did you have anything to add to that? No, I don't. Okay, the next question is, what is the estate tax exemption for 2011? Please select from 0, 1 million, 3.5 million, and 5 million. All right, and the results are in. 13% said zero, 63% said one million. Uh, no one selected 3.5 million, and the five millions are 25%. Okay, the, uh, the, yeah, and the current exemption as it stands in law today for 2011 will be a million dollars. Okay, there's some proposed legislation out there that might increase it to, to $5 million, but again, nothing is set in stone. So the, the transition from gift tax to estate tax, you know, when we talk about gift tax, it's not exclusive of, of estate tax. You know, they are, they, they are unified for tax purposes. So, you know, the, the illustration on the screen says, son, one day 60% of this will be yours, you know. That's completely true, but it really depends on what that estate tax exemption will be. So for the last 10 years, we've been dealing with a law that's been, been set in stone. In 2010, you know, that, that estate tax has been repealed. So again, a little bit about where we've come from is in 2009, that ex exemption amount was $3.5 million. So that amount, again, is what you're able to transfer estate tax free to individuals other than your spouse or charities. Uh, again, that estate tax is a graduated rate, and its its tax rate has been between 45 and 55 percent, depending on the year. So, current year, you know, there is no estate tax, but we know going into 2011 that we will have one. So, quickly, how the estate tax is calculated is very similar to the gift tax. So, assume that we have a five and a half million dollar estate and a tax rate of 50 percent. Using 2009 exemptions, we would take our $5.5 million estate, back off the exemption of $3.5 million, and multiply what's left times the 50% tax. That would leave a $1 million estate tax. Now, spouses don't share this exemption amount, and there, there's nothing that we can do like electing to split the gifts as we were talking about in gift taxes, but assume that you have a husband's estate valued at zero dollars and a wife's valued at seven million dollars. You know, if the husband dies, then the wife dies. That gives us a really bad outcome that we could have avoided. So, since you're able to transfer assets to your spouse tax-free, you know, this in this scenario where the husband had nothing and he passes away first, that leaves us in a scenario where we would owe almost two million dollars of estate tax. If the proper planning was done to split those assets and balance the estates, you know, no estate tax would have been due. So the so where we're going in the future is, you know, that that exemption amount right now is a moving target. And so uh, earlier we talked about, um, you know, which assets should you give and get away from your estate. Well, another aspect of that is, you know, if if you pass away in a year where there is some estate tax, the assets basis gets stepped up to the fair market value, except for 2010. We have some unique rules this year. So again, we want to make the point that all of these need to be, all of these topics need to be addressed together.
So to simply show where, where we're going with the state tax, we've, we've thrown up a comparison of what the law reads in 2009, 2010, and 2011 for gift taxes and estate taxes. So as you can see, the gift tax exemption amount has remained unchanged over, the, over these three years we have on screen. However, you can see that the gift tax rate is from 2009 dropped from 45% to 35% in the current year. But 2011, as the way the law reads right now, it's going to step up to 55% with potential for surcharges. The estate tax exemption is, is the more widely known topic. So again, 2009, we had a $3.5 million exemption. In 2010, we have no estate tax. Therefore, we don't need the exemption. But in 2011, the way the law reads today, that exemption amount drops back down to a million dollars. So it's going to, if this proposed legislation doesn't get passed, the estate tax is going to draw many more people into having to pay some estate tax or having to file those estate tax returns. We can see that the, uh, in terms of the tax rate, it's going up from 45% to 55%. Um, and we also have some information on the generation skipping exemptions there as well. Uh, but it is dropping from $3.5 million to $1.3 million we're estimating because that's based on inflation. And so what that has to do with is if you're, if you're giving assets away to more than one generation below you, there's another layer of tax that you have to be aware of. So where does that leave us? You know, we're, we're planning for a period of uncertainty. You know, currently we have no federal estate tax. You know, one topic that has been thrown out there is, you know, will that retro will there be what retroactive legislation for 2010? You know, at this point in the year, it's December 9th today. There still is a chance that Congress, if they act by April, could come back and retroactively apply some estate tax to 2010. Uh, there's been a lot of questions as to the constitutionality of that type of an action, but there is a precedent on the books that if they want to come back, they may be able to. Uh, we believe that if that's the case, they will give taxpayers probably the option of operating under the, the laws as they exist of no estate tax, or if it's a better solution for the taxpayers to operate under, under this retroactive legislation. Currently, there is also no federal generation skipping tax. So that's what I was referring to earlier about if you're giving assets away to more than one generation below you, uh, that there's no legislation on that. So our concerns with that is we know that that tax is coming back in 2011. So we are warn or warning clients, you know, beware of gap or non-qualified gifts to these skip generations because the tax not only is analyzed when you are making gifts, but if you're making gifts into trust, for example, the tax may be applied when assets are pulled out. So even though you're putting assets into a trust when there's no generation skipping tax, there may be tax on the back end. And again, we don't have a lot of firm legislation on that because a lot of people never thought we would get to 2010 and not have an estate tax. So the IRS has not issued a lot of clarification on how these laws will work if they stay intact. Um, as we said before, you know, the gift tax rate is currently 35% with a $1 million exemption. That tax rate is the lowest it's ever been. So some clients, you know, they are using this as an opportunity to make taxable gifts. You know, the way that they're viewing that is, you know, I can pay 35% now or I can, or if I live for another three years, you know, I'm going to take the chance that the IRS might I might pay the IRS 55%. So that's an opportunity that some clients are trying to exploit right now. But again, if some of this proposed legislation comes into play, you know, they, the proposed estate tax rate would be 35%. So that, that does take away some of the appeal of making a large gift now. Um, we talked a little bit about, you know, sunset provisions if the 2011 law reversed to 2001. Well, what I meant by that, again, is, again, the IRS hasn't issued a lot of clarification on how this law works if we get to 2011 with, no, or with these estate tax laws. It, it doesn't revert back completely to 2001 laws. So a lot, of the, a lot of the numbers in terms of the exemption amount look the same, 
but the detailed mechanics of how that law works have not been spelled out yet. So I think the IRS is also looking towards Congress to give us that guidance uh, before they try and try and come up with all the rules that they don't, again, they don't know what rules we're playing by right now. Uh, next question on there, you know, I think we got some great responses. You know, should clients review their wills and trusts in 2010? You know, for the 38% of you that said that you've done that, uh, you know, that's great that you're being proactive. Um, we are, what we're also seeing, though, is that it's very hard for clients to commit to making big changes in a year where we don't know the rules we're playing by. So th there are clients making decisions now and getting, getting fairly aggressive with the tax laws as they stand, but there are also a lot of clients who are just taking that wait-and-see approach because they really want to know what the future holds. But I think what, what we would suggest to you and the professionals you work with and what we try and incorporate again is making sure what you're doing is flexible. You know, you want to be able to take advantage of the laws as they exist today and as they might exist tomorrow or they might exist five years from now. Okay, so some recent developments that we'll, we'll talk about. Um, the proposed legislation, you know, I think we've referenced this a little bit of of the of the agreement that President Obama has with, I think, Republican leaders, uh, they're proposing to extend the Bush income tax cuts. Uh, but part of that proposal is to ex extend some uh, exemption amounts for the estate tax world. So that five million dollar exemption amount is what has been proposed in that bill with a 35 percent estate tax rate. So for those of you that answered. Uh, answered that $5 million is our exemption in 2011. That is proposed at this point. It is not written in law yet. Uh, there's a lot of unhappiness on the Democratic side of the caucus of, of how high that exemption amount has gotten. Um, there's also a lot of unhappiness on some of the Republican side about some of the other provisions inside of this proposal, uh, specifically as it relates to un extending unemployment benefits. So the trick is I think both parts of both parties are unhappy with the proposed legislation, but we think it's going to go through. I was just reflecting on the title of today's presentation, and um, although it may not be the most catchy uh, title, I, I think it is about as appropriate as, as we can come up with just reading an article from the AP, from the Associated Press, uh, a couple hours ago, um, and, and Blake just mentioned the Democrat caucus took a basically a straw poll, a, a, an oral vote that uh, they're not supportive of this plan. Uh, that doesn't mean they actually voted on a bill. It's just a matter of uh, they certainly there's certainly going to be uh, some fighting about it. That's probably not a surprise to anyone. And it will be interesting to see what the legislation actually looks like when it is written. Um, more times than not, the legislation as it is written in the House is not exactly what it is written in the Senate. And then there's basically a compromise between the two bills. Uh, the estate tax provisions seem to be a real stickler or a sticking point um, between the parties right now, not just about the income tax cuts. Um, so it will be interesting to see, and all of us will be obviously paying close attention to what Congress does and what that bill actually looks like once it gets through uh, the Senate and also through the House. Yeah, and that, that also is not the only legislation that we are watching very carefully. Um, one fantastic tool that is available to, to everyone right now is you know, if you use discount planning in your gifting, in your estate planning, um, there are bills on the floor that would limit or eliminate a lot of the discounting that is that is available today. So, you know, we urge you to be prepared for those changes when they do come. Uh, so, if that's a that's a technique you're taking advantage of, you know, you, you may you might want to accelerate some of that planning. Again, those bills are on the floor; they could pass at any time but they've also been on the floor for a couple of years now and haven't seen to gain some traction. We do know that that is a target, though, of, 
of President Obama and some of the Democrats in Congress. And uh, some more recent developments, uh, specifically from the IRS's perspective, is one of the biggest thorns that they have in their sides is what's called a family limited partnership. On the screen it's called a FLP, a flip. So the IRS continues to attack these arrangements of these family limited partnerships uh, because they, they view these as almost a tax shelter um, and because they also use a lot of discounting when you're involved with these limited partnerships. So the IRS is winning on a lot of these arguments if the client, if clients such as yourselves, you know, keep beneficial use of assets if it's truly an asset of the partnership. So in, in other words, you can't put an asset up into a partnership and retain sole usage of that asset. You can't, you have to retain a proportional usage of these assets. Um, or if there's an applied agreement that you would be able to use those assets. You know, the IRS is attacking those and, and basically blowing these transactions up if that's the case. Um, we would also suggest that, you know, if you're using transactions to where you're, you're forming entities and giving away ownership in these entities, you know, make sure that there's some time between the formation and the gifting because these step transactions, as we call them, you know, again, the IRS is coming back in and, and collapsing those transactions to the detriment of the taxpayer, and they're winning. And, and one other item that's been coming up is, is when you're talking about how estates are paying estate taxes, you know, some estates don't have the capital to to pay these estate taxes, so they're going and getting loans uh, to make those tax payments. Well, the IRS really doesn't like that structure because, uh, in short, the estate is able to take a deduction for the future interest expense. So what the IRS is saying is, well, you shouldn't be doing that. You know, you have assets in these partnerships or in these corporations, you know, you, you, be, you should be able to pull money from these entities to pay your taxes. Well, that, that sounds great in theory, but then if, if you do that as a client and a taxpayer, the IRS is going to come back and attack that that entity was really a sham. And again, they're going to collapse the transactions. So if you're doing, using some of these advanced techniques, you know, just make sure that you're, you're crossing your T's, dotting your I's, making sure that you have all your ducks in a row because the IRS is coming and attacking on technicalities right now. And I think the last topic that, that we do have for today is to, to address some concerns about asset protection. And so, you know, a lot of what we talked about today is, you know, how do you facilitate your estate plan with your gifting plan to transition assets to that next generation? But again, as I said earlier, a bigger and bigger piece of this, of this overall design and blueprint is how do we protect these assets? You know, whether it be from divorce, litigation, creditors, um, and what we mean by divorce is not necessarily your divorce, you know, or your children's divorce. It could be grandchildren. You know, if we're talking about this this trust environment that Jim described earlier, you know, it's not as as locked in a box as, as what it was at one time. Putting assets inside of these trusts can protect from a lot of these events that we're talking about today. Um, you know, I read statistics recently, and I think a, one that gets thrown out quite common is, you know, roughly half of the marriages in the U.S. today end up in a divorce. Well, if you look at that a little bit closer is, you know, usually a first marriage, there's about 40% that ends up in a divorce. A second marriage, uh, that, that number rises to about 60%. And it keeps rising the more marriages that, that are in place. But the point is, you know, chances are someone in your family at some point will have a divorce. Uh, you know, we're not saying it's anybody's fault, but the chances are out there that, that that's going to happen. So how do you protect your family assets from going to, to this in-law? Um, litigation, you know, we talked a little bit about, you know, if you have a minor child and they, you know, they end up in an accident and, God forbid, kill someone, you know, if that other person's family comes and attacks the minor's assets and your assets, you know, finding that environment to, to shield those claims uh, has become a very vital piece of this planning. So we're talking about, you know, using these trusts to help provide some of this protection. 
uh, but we want to make clear that not all trusts provide the same level of protection. So earlier when I referenced that, you know, if you create your own trust where you're the trustee and the beneficiary, um, you know, typically that's not going to provide any protection from these divorces or creditors that we're talking about. You have to give up some control to get some of this protection. And then we'd also say that not all jurisdictions provide the same level, level of protection. So, you know, most commonly you would create the trust in the state that you reside in. So whether that be Colorado or Kansas or Nebraska, you know, it's just easy to do it that way. But there are some states out there right now that, that do provide uh, a lot more certain protection, whether it be from creditors specifically. Um, those would include South Dakota, Delaware, Nevada, and Alaska. Um, they, they just have stood up to some of this scrutiny a lot more than other states have because they have better, better credit protection laws. Uh, and the last bullet point on there I think that we'll address today is, you know, we talk about the transition of the business and family assets to that next generation, um, you know, buy-sell agreements. You know, making sure that you have the agreement in place whether you're dealing with, you know, whether you're in business with siblings or in a closely held business with a partner. You know, having that agreement in place to make sure that the business will stay with the family it's supposed to upon someone's passing is huge in terms of asset protection because, again, you don't want those assets getting outside of, of your control or your realm of influence. But it's great to have these agreements in place. But the second step to this and where we see a lot of shortfalls with, with clients is making sure that these agreements are funded, either with capital or with life insurance, you know, making sure that you have enough assets to, to purchase the business interest from a decedent. And with that, I think uh, we got one last uh, illustration here is, you know, the dragon ate the prince, but the trust lived happily ever after. So, you know, what Jim referred to earlier is the, tr the trust doesn't have to be locked in a box. Well, it can be. You know, these trusts can last a long time. So uh, they are a great tool for asset protection. I like that story. That's one of my favorite stories. <laughs> And you know you really made it as a topic. So you know, estate planning has been a, a hugely popular topic for the last year. Uh, this this actually made it onto episodes of Law and Order. And so the bad guys at the end of this day in the Law and Order episode ended up being the accountants. So that, that's why this cartoon talks about the estate lawyers, mom. You know, doesn't talk at all about the accountants. <laughs> so guys, I think we have one more poll question, don't we? Yes, we do. All right. And that question is, in the next to make changes to your current estate plan, very likely, somewhat likely, or not likely? Okay. And the results are 43% very likely, zero somewhat likely, and leading the pack not likely at 57%. All right, so let's go to Q&A. You guys ready for that? We've had some questions that have been coming in. And the first one is, at what net worth value should one consider using a trust? Who wants to answer that one? Uh, this is Jim. I'll, I'll take that one and certainly ask Blake to uh, jump in. Um, you know, there's really really not a magic formula, but something we have looked at traditionally is, at least as it relates to estate tax itself, um, we generally, generally would be looking at a trust as a viable tool 
for planning purposes, if your and if you're married, your spouse's estate is getting close to the exemption amount. So in the example of a $1 million lifetime exemption for estate purposes, if, uh, if, if you are worth a million or approaching a million, um, it sure may be viable as a, as a planning tool to use a trust. Or if you're married, looking at a uh, somewhere in that one to two million range, uh, it, would, it would certainly be something that, that you and your professionals would, would want to look at as a tool to use. Okay. Yeah, and I would I would also add in the you know the the cost of forming trust documents and getting getting that in place. You know it it shouldn't it shouldn't be a deterrent for the most part. You know the cost on those have become pretty reasonable. I would say when you compare it to the formation of a will and potentially you know probate costs. Right. And again, just to reiterate, the use of trust again from the estate tax side. Is a, is a wonderful tool, and, and I, I believe the context, context of that, that question may have come from that. There are a lot of other reasons to, to use trust as a tool as well that have, that have not much to do with the estate tax in and of itself. All right, the next question is, I see a CPA and a CFP designation for the panel. Does estate planning typically involve an attorney? Yes. Okay. Um, next question, are health savings accounts protected from creditors in the same way as retirement account funds? Uh, that, that's determined by, by state law. Um, I, and I don't know the, the rules as it pertains to the state of Colorado, but but we can get that answer. Well, we'll we'll make sure we get that answer back to the person that that asked it. Um, how do IRA accounts fit into estate planning? Are there flexible ways to manage them? There are ways to manage IRAs. Um, you know, the w with the IRAs, you also have to take into consideration the income tax consequences of that type of investment, because whenever money gets pulled out, it's all taxable at ordinary income rates. So, when you're talking about estate planning, uh, with, as it relates to IRAs, you know, first question is, you know, who's your primary beneficiary? Well, typically, that's going to be your spouse if you're married. Uh, and if if you choose someone other than your spouse, you know they're they're going to have to sign a release saying they acknowledge that that you've changed beneficiaries. So so making the spouse a beneficiary in combination with with your will or your estate or children, uh, there are flexible ways to do that. Um, you know, a term that that gets thrown out there a lot is a stretch IRA. You know, being able to pass IRAs from one generation to another. Uh, you know, it, it's a tool that works. It, it all just depends on what your end goal is that you have in mind with the IRA. Uh, another way that, or another flexible way that we've been able to use IRAs uh, from an estate planning perspective is to consider a conversion to a Roth IRA. Um, you know, changing the characteristic of the account to where when you pull money out, it's not taxable income. You pay tax upon the conversion, but if you have time for those for those investments that continue to grow, um, that can be a powerful estate planning tool. All right. The next question that we have is, I've been involved and in probate has been a hassle. What are your thoughts on how to avoid going through probate? Well, as I mentioned earlier, you know, we talked about trust a little bit. You know, trusts are a way that you can avoid going through that probate process uh, because if you have the assets, if you have your assets titled into a trust, you know, th that trust will de decide where your assets are going and ha determine how the, the trust will be administered. If your assets pass by a will, you know, that will is going to be 
a public record to go through the court system, the probate court system, um, and ultimately a judge is going to read your will and determine, hey, here's where your assets go. So your executor is going to work with that with that court to make sure that make sure that you go through this process. The drawback to probate is it can get expensive. So earlier when I referenced you know the cost of a trust versus the cost of probate, you know that's a very real consideration that you have to give. But also you need to consider privacy issues. You know if you want privacy, a trust is a good answer. If you if you don't mind having a public record of your will, probate works as well. But I would say one advantage of probate that the trust document doesn't have is that when once your assets go through the probate process, it gives complete title to whoever inherits those. So what I mean by that is there's no room for anybody to challenge the outcome of that probate process. Whereas in a trust environment, there is an opportunity for beneficiaries to challenge things, which could get costly. All right. Uh, one more quick question. Is it true that life insurance values are included in your estate? And, and that is true. Um, we actually run into this a lot in planning where folks are surprised to learn that life insurance proceeds become part of the decedent's estate. Now, it depends on how the policy is owned, but again, generally speaking, uh, taking an example, again, in a husband-wife situation, the husband owns a life insurance policy, and upon his passing, the proceeds are paid to his surviving spouse. Uh, the proceeds of that life insurance policy are not taxed for income purposes, but they are part of the decedent's estate. And okay. there's, for whatever reason, it is uniquely, life insurance is uniquely treated under the estate tax laws where you can actually avoid that situation by creating what's called a life insurance trust. And uh, we don't have enough time today to get into those details, but there is a, a fairly common technique that you could use to avoid having those proceeds, life insurance proceeds, included in your estate. All right. Well, gentlemen, we are out of time. Uh, I do want to remind everybody that uh, this webinar is available for download. It will be. Uh, it takes it about an hour to load in or two, but it will be on the NCBR website. If you go to www.ncbr.com, Scroll down the left-hand side toward the bottom and select webinar series. That's where you'll find it. Um, I want to thank everyone for participating today. I trust that you all found the sessions very informative, as I did. And, and gentlemen, I want to thank you both for your, uh, your talking points today. It, it really was very informative. Um, and we've got on the screen contact information for both uh, Jim and Blake there. Uh, I do in, encourage everyone to uh, feel free to follow up with them to ask further questions that we may not have been able to get to today. Thanks again to everyone, and please enjoy the rest of your day. Bye now. Thank you, Jim.